Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks to Jeff and Chris for this great event. This has really been uh, an exciting couple of days for me personally, and I'm sure for all of you as well. Uh, I, too, am humbled to be here. Um, a little bit about myself and why I'm talking to you today. Um, I'm a marketer and a game designer. And a couple years ago, I got involved with education pretty seriously. I work for the biggest company in education, Pearson Education. And they brought me in originally as a consultant. They said, what, what should we do about games and education? It seems like lots of kids play games. Lots of kids don't like school. And we'd like to talk to you about that. So we had a series of conversations. And we uh, have a little startup within Pearson called Alley Oop, which is trying to tackle some of the issues around college readiness. Uh, one of the things that you know, uh, was brought home uh, during this conference to me is the huge problem of high school dropouts. I mean, there was a guy yesterday that talked about how that can be a good thing, and I think for him it probably was. Um, but it's a tragedy, and there's a, there's a problem with, with the numbers. You know, when, when somebody you know has something bad happen to them, uh, it, it's, it's deeply personal. When you hear of what it, what it is, 800 and something kids dropping out every hour, it's unimaginable. Um, and, and so I think what I want to do today is just throw a bunch of ideas at you guys about what we can do to tap into what works in video games to help us make education a little bit more interesting and engaging and maybe stem the tide a little bit. So this is a slide I, I show a lot. And, you know, when you talk to young people, what do you think they would rather do? The image on the left, does anybody know what that is? World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft has, you know, millions and millions of people playing day in and day out. They have around 8 million people who play this game 40 hours a week. Some of those are adults, but a lot of them are young people as well. And if you look at that screen, the World of Warcraft screen is a lot more complex than, than solving an algebra equation. And yet kids will learn how to interact in that world that is highly complex, highly social, um, and be successful. Uh, it's, it's said in World of Warcraft it takes about 650 hours to get to the good stuff. What if we got kids to work even half of that time, 300 hours, to get the good stuff in education? So engagement is really where a lot of this comes into. Um, I like to talk about context in terms of games. There's a couple game screens up here. Um, there's actually a game that I've just gotten hooked on recently called Plague for the iPad. How many of you guys are gamers? We've got a couple out there, and I think the rest of you guys are all lying. Um, if you have an iPhone, if you have a Blackberry, last night I was eating dinner, and next to me was a, a typical New York suit uh, on his Blackberry while he was eating and drinking, and he was playing Breakout. Everybody remember Breakout when you had a BlackBerry? It was like the only game for the BlackBerry. Now there's millions of games available for most of our devices today, and I'm sure all of you guys play them. Uh, Plague is a game that I got hooked on on the iPad, and what it does is it kind of flips the roles a little bit. You have to infect the world with a plague. Um, and there's, a, there's another game up there called Killer Flu that I worked on where we actually made infecting this island the, the goal of the game. And what happens when you switch roles like that, you change the context, and you can actually learn a lot about what it means to uh, spawn a plague. Um, the other thing that happened when I worked on Killer Flu is when you make a game, you have to know everything about the subject matter. You might bring in subject matter experts, and that's always a good idea. But you find that you have to learn how H1N1 evolves, how it spreads, in order to gamify it, or to create a game, or create a simulation. And by putting players in the role of the actual disease, you can learn a lot about a complex subject. <clears throat> the other thing that you know, I, I, I think has come up several times during this conference is this idea of play. Games are fun. Um, games are, 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 are filled with joy. Games that we play in the playground, games that we play in the classroom, games that we play online, games that we play through our console or our iDevice uh, bring a lot of joy to our lives. And actually, that's why 
people will work hard in a place like World of Warcraft to get to the good stuff. And I think that there's something that we can learn there in education as well. This other idea uh, that I think is sometimes lacking in, in education is that, you know, the sense of progress, this feedback loop. When you play a game, no matter how small or big it is, you're constantly given feedback. The other thing that's really important is you're told where you are and what you need to do next. In game design, we often create a game map. So whatever kind of game you're playing, there's some sort of map you can go to or reference uh, if you get stuck. And that map usually does a very good job of telling you where you've been, where you are, and where you need to go. The other thing that's really exciting about that context is that good game design makes the player think they have an infinite number of choices. And the bigger the game, you know, there's certainly a possibility to have many, many choices. But that's a game design technique. And some of the things I've heard over the last couple of days about what you guys are working on uh, include that kind of you know, student-directed choice. Like, what project am I going to work on to learn this complex principle? And we do that in games all the time. <clears throat> this other thing that has also come up, and obviously with the context here today around social, um, is that, you know, there's a ton of social games out there. The most popular video games in the world are inherently social. Everything from Farmville to World of Warcraft to uh, Medal of Honor, the, the huge amount of, of interactive gameplay that happens in these, in these worlds uh, creates really interesting opportunities for engagement and really interesting learning opportunities. You talk to young people who are playing like a massively multiplayer game where they're playing, uh, you know, a, a game online through like a Sony network or Xbox Live, um, and they're learning how to work with others. They're learning leadership. They're learning teamwork. These are um, skills that in high school, I think somebody mentioned yesterday, it's you know, collaboration in high school is cheating, but in the workforce, it's, you know, it's, it's teamwork, it's collaboration, it's leadership. And I, th I think we need to infuse a lot more collaboration in our formal learning. Like, what if you could take the SAT test with your three best friends? Like, which, which people would you choose? I mean, it starts making this stuff really interesting. So another thing that I like to talk about in terms of, you know, game design is... Uh, this complex idea of time. And I mentioned numbers earlier. I think both those things are interrelated. Games do a really good job of compressing time. You can have a game that takes you several hours to play, maybe 15 minutes to play, but it could encompass uh, a thought process that would be like over years, for, uh, for example. So I'll give you an example of uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, there's a game we worked on uh, a while back for... Cold Stone Creamery. Has anybody eaten at Cold Stone Creamery? Okay, so great ice cream, right? Uh, but every time you go there, you get this giant slab of ice cream, which is great for us, the customers. But if you own a Cold Stone and their franchises, uh, that big giant mound of ice cream that doesn't quite fit in the cup size that you ordered is profit walking out the door. So you turn to your 17-year-old employees and you say, look, that's, that's profit walking out the door. And they say, well, it's like, what, 15 cents, 25 cents, a dollar. That doesn't mean anything to me. So we created a game um, that was originally named Size Matters, but we had to change the name to something else that was more corporate. And you serve customers in the game, and at the end of your shift, which takes place over about two to five minutes, you are um, told how much you overserved or underserved. And it's added up over your shift. It tells you, okay, this is how much you would have overserved over a month, and this is how much you would have overserved over a year. And those numbers quickly go up. And you start looking at numbers that are like $7,000, $10,000 over the period of a year, a profit that went out the door based on overserving. And that now means something to a young person. 17-year-olds uh, aren't going to read an employee manual. And 17-year-olds in your high school courses are probably not reading their entire textbooks. But they, are, they were more than willing to interact with the game. And I think there's a lesson there. <clears throat> the other thing that's pretty exciting is kind of this intersection of games and 21st century skills. If you talk about critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, those two specifically, one of the best ways to develop those skills are through games. Good gamers, what do they do when they first get a video game? Do you think they read the instructions? They don't. 
They jump into the game and they learn by failing. The great video game players will go into a game and just die, 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 die. They want to test the edges. They want to see how far they can go. And as game designers, we like that. Uh, we like young people, we like old people playing our games, we like people playing our games in ways we never thought were possible. And that skill set of testing the edges or finding the edges in a game, I think actually translates really well to the kinds of skill sets that we want in our employees in the next century. And then the last point here um, that I want to talk about is, you know, this generation of gamers. You know, with all these iDevices and, and, and one of the most exciting parts of the game industry right now is kind of that um, two to five year old age range. If you're making a game right now, that's where you can make money. Um, the rest of the game industry is flattened out in other areas, but young people are playing games. There's amazing numbers of two-year-olds that are playing video games. This is the generation that's going to expect more in a classroom than a chalkboard and a textbook. And I'd urge all you folks here today that are working on solutions to help fix the problems in education to think about the two-year-olds that are growing up on an iPad, you can just imagine what their expectations are going to be when they get into your freshman high school class or your freshman college class. Uh, they're going to be digital natives. They're going to be social natives. They're going to be gaming natives. Um, and I think there's a lot we're going, to have to, we're going to have to do to meet those expectations and to make sure they don't become one of those kids that are dropping out almost every second, minute, or hour of the day. So the last thing I'd like to say is, you know, thanks again for the opportunity to talk here today. Let's make learning fun again. I think all of us in this room can agree, and those online can agree, that real learning is actually fun. But sometimes school is not fun, or the act of learning is not fun. And I think there's a lot we can borrow from the video game industry to find ways to make learning fun again. So thank you very much.